right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Carol Kinsey-Goman, who is up in Berkeley in Northern California. How are you doing, Carol? I'm doing well. I'm enjoying the rain here. I know that people in other parts of the U.S. are having a little more weather problems, but we've needed the rain so badly that I'm good. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we have, and we've had rain down here as well. Um, and, but, you know, coming from Ireland where we have like rain all year round, it's nice that we just, you know, fit in a couple of days here and there in, in oh, San yes. Diego. <laughs> yes, yes, I prefer uh, the sun personally, I'm with yeah, you. <laughs> no, exactly, that's why I'm here. Um, and Carol is the president of Kinsey Consulting Services, international keynote speaker for corporations, conferences, universities, government agencies. And you are an authority on the impact of body language in the workplace. And what we want to talk about today is your book, uh, Stand Out, How to Build Your Leadership Presence. Great. Okay, so Carol, let's get straight into it. What do you mean by leadership presence in particular? Well, you know, because it's a, uh, an elusive and subjective term, the first thing that I learned about leadership presence was everything that it wasn't. You know, mm -hmm. it wasn't about your title. It didn't reflect necessarily your technical savvy or even your intelligence. It really, leadership presence is really about how other people perceive you. And that perception is learned from a combination of signals things that you send through your body language, mm -hmm. your emotional state, and the way you communicate. And so, of course, you don't have total control over the way people perceive you, but you may have more control than you think. In, in my work, I look at five qualities that people want to see in their leaders, or they, they, when they see those qualities, they deem people as leaders. Or if you're in sales, they deem mm. you as having presence and authority. So those are credibility, confidence, coping, connection, and charisma. Ah. Um, okay, so let's let's get into it uh, then. If, if you're somebody and you want to establish a good presence, so you need to pay attention to these five areas. So let's talk about credibility. How do you how do you come across or project yourselves as having credibility and being authentic? All right. First of all. When I talk about leadership presence, it's not about pretending or faking that you have mm. these qualities. If you don't, aren't credible, it doesn't matter pretty much what you do. You need to work on being credible. But most of the mm. people that I work with are credible. And what I'm helping them do is learn how to better express that yeah. so that you align people's impression with your best authentic self, but you're not faking it. It's not a fake it till you make it kind of process. It's really a process of knowing your own credibility and then being able to express it. So for instance, you might be authentically knowledgeable, innovative, skilled, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that other people see you as mm -hmm. the credible person you are. And some of the things I see that happening most with communication skills, with verbal communication skills, yeah. by the way, when you when you do things like uh, start your sentences with qualifiers. So you're saying something like, you probably already thought about this. Anything you say after that minimizes your credibility. Or this, is, this, this may be a stupid idea, but mm -hmm. might as well not say it you know, if it's a stupid <laughs> idea. You really will be evaluated as much more credible if you consciously work on dropping those qualifiers and just say, here's my idea, mm -hmm. or have you thought of this? And then present your idea straight on, but don't qualify and which minimizes that contribution. It's really interesting. It's really interesting, yeah. Carol, isn't it? How, how we are very good at undermining ourselves. Just like what you said there is, I may be highly credible. I may be highly um, skilled, have great knowledge, have great things to offer you, but by the choice of the way I deliver things, I can completely undermine that. Absolutely. And you know what I noticed about myself listening to other recordings is how often I use the phrase, I think. Mm. And that in itself is a qualifier. It, it, 
you probably wouldn't want to say I know, but you might just state it without, or I might just state it without saying I think. So if you catch me doing that, let me know because it's very helpful as I, you know, work on my own presence. The other thing that I noticed about this kind of credibility is that you might not always want to use this technique, but it's a really good technique to have. And that is practice starting with the headline. Mm -hmm. Too many of us, if we were presenting, like say to a, oh, I don't know, our senior leadership, yep. we might start our sentences with something like, or our presentation with something like, you know, we've been trying to fill this, you know, for a long time and we've looked at different people for filling this role and we, we looked at Bill. Bill was really a good candidate, but I don't know. Carol was blah, 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 blah. Rather than saying, we hired Bill. Yeah. Here's why. It's, it's not always the way you want to communicate, but you'd be surprised how often that starting with all the background noise or all the fillers really undermines your credibility state it and then give the bullet points or and that's even if they want to hear those yeah and it's true and and it's a it's a funny it's a funny thing that uh adults have a tendency to do is the thing called argument dilution as you know well, kids are fantastic at uh, at negotiation argument because they pick one point and they just hammer it home and they stick to it adults we tend to you know, give you a, a, a an argument or a, or a um, or a reason why we did something, and then before you've even had time to consume it, we start offering you more and more, and it actually undermines yeah. undermines our argument. It does simplicity, particularly these days when people's attention span is getting smaller and smaller. It's really just not a nice to have communication skill. It's a necessity. Like I say, you wouldn't always want to use that perhaps, but boy, to have that skill and know when to employ it will really put you ahead, particularly in people's assessment of how credible you are. Yeah. And there's also that thing because you're, I mean, the second one you said is, is confidence. Yeah. Uh, but, but there's also that thing of uh, the imposter syndrome. And I think that's a lot of people really suffer from that because they do, they start to think, okay, I've got great ideas. I've got great experience. I've got great things to offer. And then they get onto a call with Carol now and suddenly they go, oh, I think she's really smart and probably knows more than me. And maybe I don't know as much as I thought I did. And, and suddenly I'm in a defensive mode. Yeah. And one of the things that happens is we tend to notice our mistakes. Our brains are really triggered to pick up negativity first mm -hmm. because that's what made us safe. So we also notice our mistakes a lot more than we notice our successes. I had one client who was a female when she came into my office, those days when you could come into someone's office. And I said, I've heard amazing things about you. Tell me about yourself. What is one thing that you do extremely well that you know, you'd really want another employer to know if you were going out looking for a job. And this very bright, very intelligent, very credible woman went blank. And she wow. said, Carol, I do a lot of things well, but when I do them, I don't notice it. Mm. And I think that's one of the huge areas that all of us could work on. That idea of noticing we do something well if we have to write it down for a while so that we have a success log that we read at the end of the day, because it doesn't have to be something big. Mm -hmm. I handled that telephone conversation really well, or, hey, I finished the first page of a proposal that I wanted to write, whatever that is. If you just start noticing your successes, it will help you not dwell so much on the things that aren't going well. Yeah, no, it's such a great point. I'm glad you raised that, Carol. It's such a great point because I've, I've been through that a couple of times with people where they think they're not qualified for things or, or whatever. And when I sit down and like say, OK, let's talk about your experience. Like, tell me some of the things you've done. And suddenly you're like, wow, you've got this wealth of experience. And they're like, oh, I never. Yeah, I guess I do. Um, exactly. So to your point is we're really good at ignoring that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I find the same thing when I coach people, the very same thing over and over. And it's part of the delight of being a coach is you just help people realize mm -hmm. how great they are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah what a great job. Um, you have a great job. 
Um, and the, ne the next one, composure. And here's really interesting, right? Is obviously composure is good at the best of times, but now as we exist in this virtual world, uh, we have, uh, you've seen a lot of people who are, who are normally like maybe very good in person and all of that, but they, they lose confidence and composure when it comes to virtual because they can't get the same cues or whatever, or there's silences and you know, people are petrified of silence and all that. So how do you, how do you, uh, you know, advise and help people to learn to be a little bit more composed? Well, let's talk about confidence and composure together then, because mm -hmm. that's, that's a great, a great uh, duo. The interesting thing about confidence is that it is in it's correlated with competence. Now it's an incorrect correlation because we know a lot of people who look confident aren't competent at all. They're just confident. But if you are competent, which again, as you and I know, or the people we work with are, then helping them display confidence allows other people to see their competence. It's a very interesting Mm -hmm. dynamic. And that also comes with composure, being able to keep your calm under pressure, your poise under pressure. I have several people in my family who are in the police department, and they all tell me the same thing. It doesn't matter what your title is. If there's a crisis and you're the one keeping your composure, people turn to you as the leader automatically. So it's an interesting thing set of things to work on. I think that for both composure and confidence, your body language can really help. When you are in expansive body language poses, when your shoulders are back, when your head is straight over your, over your shoulders, when you're facing people directly, particularly in this kind of a forum, when you mm -hmm. use open gestures, when you do things that are, that help you look like you are stable and settled and confident. It also makes you feel that way. Yeah. There's that wonderful body-mind connection that when we are in a bad mood or frightened or not composed, we tend to, to pull in and make ourselves smaller as if we want the predator not to be able to see us. And when we feel good, we put our bodies automatically in more expansive postures. Well, doing that, sitting like this, starts to make you feel less confident and less composed. And sitting like this really makes you feel more confident and in control. Yeah, no, it's it's a great point. And, it, and, to, uh, and the fact is that you can do that in this environment too. There's no excuse, you can sit up straight, you can look right. straight at the camera. You can get yourself into that. And I think that's what it is. I think a lot of people sort of just shy away from that or think, oh, well, we'll be back in the we'll be back in the real world soon. But but the fact is that they're going to have to use this medium for a long time to come. And some and sometimes it won't. And in some areas it won't go back. So you have to learn how to bring your presence and your composure and your confidence through this little camera. Yep, I'm calling it the hybrid future because mm. I think we will have some some face-to-face -face interaction. Yes. I know as a speaker, I long for a live audience. Yeah. I just love being with people, watching their reactions and taking those cues, knowing when they didn't get something because I can see it in their faces or the way their bodies turn away uh, slightly. You know, I mean, there's, it's a such a much richer connection and never mind just that energy that happens when people get together. There, it, it's an amazing thing. But as you said, we are entering a future where this medium is going to be part of us. So we need to learn how to project all of these qualities, both in person, because people will be dying for those signals. They'll be looking mm -hmm. at everything you do, even if it's unconscious because they haven't seen them. And then we need to realize that on this small screen, people have lost a lot. You mentioned, mm -hmm. you mentioned the thing about silence. And I find that online silence can be a very important aspect. For instance, if I were giving a live presentation and I wanted to say, this is an important point, I might walk and then stand still when I delivered that point. And that would give more emphasis to the importance. On Zoom, I would do it differently. I would say, this is very important. 
and I would pause as a signal that you need to listen to what I'm going to say next. Or after I said it, I would pause as a signal for, I'm going to give you a little more time to absorb what I just said, because it's key. Yeah. And, and I love that you raise that as well, because I really do encourage people to embrace silences and pauses, um, especially people get very afraid of them, especially online. They feel like they always need to fill the space or they or they heard once upon a time that that uh, phrase dead air from radio or TV and they think, oh, dead air, can't have dead air. Uh, and yet all they do is end up um, you know, undermining themselves because they don't give that moment, as you said, for the other person to compose themselves, to lean into the important point or to digest what you just said. Right. And that, that's the main thing is that when we lack all of those body language, nonverbal cues that we get face to face, our brains have to work over time to make sense of what's going on, which is why we're in Zoom fatigue so often, mm -hmm. because it is hard. So when you do pause, you're really respectful of your audience by giving them time to absorb, because we all need a little more time. And I agree with you on these Zoom interactions. We're trying to get through as fast as we can and get all this information so we can get this you know, meeting over quickly. <laughs> and that's probably not the most productive choice. No, no, because uh, it will come across uh, in your tone and in your body language, you know, that you're trying to get through something as opposed to embracing the moment. And um, let's talk a little bit about connection, because here's here's another word or phrase that has so many different interpretations today. So what do you mean by connection? Well, I'll give you two examples in a nonverbal way. Connection is expressed in body language signals like nods and smiles and head tilts, which is the universal sign of giving someone your ear in those open palm gestures, which is pretty much the universal signal for see, I have nothing to hide. I'm your friend, I'm on your side. So non-verbally you express warmth and the tone of your voice. You express warmth through those mediums verbally the interesting part of connection, of course, is that empathy is best expressed by listening. Mm. So empathetic listening, we are totally focused. And how hard is that these days just to be totally focused <laughs> yep. on whomever is speaking, where you are asking questions to make sure you understand their point of view. And when, and this is the hardest for many of us, you are suppressing your own desire to prematurely solve that problem when perhaps the person really just needs to be heard. And by the way, if you haven't really heard them, you may not be solving the right problem anyway. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. And underline that point again, if you're just gonna jump in the minute you hear something that sounds like it's a problem that you can solve, you run the risk of it either being a problem that they don't care to solve or, it, you never get to the real issues where you know you could really make an impact, and then and then finally um, charisma. So most people would say charisma, you either have it or you don't. You're born with it or you're not born with it. And I think if you're thinking of the kind of charisma that rock stars or movie stars have, you know, when they're on the red carpet and the lights are shining and the paparazzi is there and they are flamboyant. You're probably right. Uh, most business leaders, most salespeople, most of us don't have that kind of charisma and don't need it, thank goodness. Uh, when I think of charisma, I think of it as a magnetic force that draws people to you. And all of us have our own unique way of doing that. And if you go back through the five C's that, or the four C's, because this is the fifth, there is that magnetic force that I talked about. If you're strength, if you can relax into your strength. So if your strength is your coping skills, realize that in a crisis, people will turn to you automatically. You will be charismatic because you have that ability. There was a chief executive officer that I worked with in New York, and he was one of the worst speakers I'd ever heard. But the man, when he spoke, to a room full of 2,000 or more people in his organization, you could hear a pin drop as they hung on every word he said. Mm -hmm. 
because that man had also done every job in the company, just about, as he worked his way up to being the chief executive officer. And he had such credibility that his speaking style mattered very little. So he could relax. I don't mean that you shouldn't work on sure, those, sure. that, you know, to be better, a better communicator, but you also need to know what you're already really good at. So if your reputation, your credibility precedes you, embrace that and relax into that strength and that will become your natural charisma. You will draw people to you. Certainly connection. I have gone into very busy people's offices and they will stop everything and pay such focused attention on me that I walk out of there thinking, this is the most charismatic person I've ever met. <laughs> so, you know, it, know what you do well. Again, you don't have to fake things. Know what you do well, relax into that, embrace that, and let that draw people toward you. Yeah, listen, that was beautifully said, I have to say. Uh, I love that idea of relaxing into your strength, uh, knowing what you're good at. I think those are fantastic takeaways for people. Um, so as we're drawing to the end here, all of all of Carol's information is going to be below this video, including links to the book and her website and all that good stuff. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, I and <laughs> now that's a good question, because 2019, I was still an international keynote speaker. I was in Kuwait. I was in Paris. I was in Brussels. I was um, all over the place. This last year, I've been an international keynote speaker on webinars and Zoom meetings. And I have to say, again, as convenient as that has been, I really miss, I really miss the audiences. I miss the travel, and I know how exhausting that could be internationally. And I realize that that probably won't happen as much in the future. But I am also, as you mentioned, an author. Here's the, this isn't the book, by the way. This is simply a postcard of the book. But it's doing very well. That came out in September called Stand Out, How to Build Your Leadership Presence. And I am a coach. And again, I am now a virtual coach. Yeah. So as we have all morphed, and pivoted. I feel like I pivoted so much I could be a ballet dancer. <laughs> that, uh, I, so we, and I am looking forward to a more hybrid future where I can do a little of both and where I can continue to develop my skills on each, realizing those skills are slightly different when I change mediums. Yeah, listen, that's great. And I think a lot of people can relate to, to what you're saying. Listen, Carol, this has been fantastic. Some great takeaways. Totally recommend that you check out the book, Stand Out, How to Build Your Leadership Presence. As you saw from this interview, those five steps, uh, areas to focus on are very clear, very concise. So I really would uh, encourage that. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thanks again, Carol, and thank you all. And I will see you for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.